The following conversation with Carl Handel took place on Manhattan's West Side on March 8, 2022. Carl Handel is an artist based in Los Angeles. His finely rendered drawings of animals, hands, and football players are presented in large-scale installations, challenging our perceptions of the ordinary media imagery we encounter every day. So you grew up in New York and you've lived in LA for some time. And um, as, as, has the cultural divide between New York and Los Angeles narrowed in the last 10 years, would you say, with, with sort of back and forth of the art world? Or are they still really different places culturally? No, I think it's gotten closer because, I mean, everyone always looks back at whatever period they were in their 20s as the seminal, as the best time. But definitely when I moved to LA, it was a smaller art world. There were a few collectors, but they weren't like giant collectors, they weren't giant galleries. So it was based right. around the art schools and the teachers yeah. who taught there and they would come to the art openings and it was just like your community was whether you were Cal Arts or UCLA or Art Center. Like a satellite in some ways of uh, the market was here, the you know, the production of, of artists was there in some ways. In New York, the well-known artists often didn't teach, but in LA, they did teach. And like my teachers were Charlie Ray and Paul McCarthy and John Baldessari and Kathy Opie. I asked this question in some ways because I think of your work, your drawings as being kind of pictographic. Let's talk about your choice of subject matter, but also this technique you have. I came to it more through thinking about labor and time and less about skill, even though skill and technique do have a relationship to mm -hmm. labor and time. I guess for a contemporary artist, I am able to draw fairly well, but in the realm of people who can draw, I don't draw especially <laughs> well. It's mm -hmm. just not something you see that, that often. Right. But the ability to render is, you know, it's a specialized skill. So I think of it more like I started as a photographer and it somehow was too quick and too easy for the image just to sort of appear. Mm -hmm. And when I got to grad school, I found myself having a lot of time and also seeing a lot of the other artists around like making stuff with their hands. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to find a way, and, and I like making stuff with my hands, mm -hmm. besides talking with my hands. <laughs> here. But um, I wanted to make something with my hands and I wanted to have a kind of tactility and a kind of time that I was able to put into it that I couldn't do with photography. And mm -hmm. that's sort of how I, I landed on this drawing. There's an interesting um, kind of double standard in the art world about sort of the time and labor, the technique, versus like the ideas. This show that I have up now is a little different because it's everything in there is like fairly highly rendered. And a lot of times with other shows, maybe there'll be an abstraction, there'll be some text right. works. So everything is not this super realist, but I throw it in there. But there's a bias among some people in the art world mm -hmm. against this kind of, because it's, um, it's a little lowbrow, mm -hmm. it can be. Mm -hmm. It's a little populist. Um, although the art world is changing a lot and now like sort of lowbrow is highbrow. Right. <laughs> and right, highbrow right. would question like why a pile of bricks should be art and we're like, boy, there's a lot of race and class bound up in that and maybe it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So I think there might be more room now, but I also recognize that I am often more involved in more highbrow ideas, mm -hmm. but I also want to provide an entry for students or people who don't have an art history background. Right. And that can be something where they come in and be like, wow. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Now I try to, if I don't take the picture myself, I buy it. I know that the people, let's say, were, you know, in the image were paid for it, like everything is okay, mm -hmm. or I just take it myself. Mm -hmm. So it brings me back to photography. So the current show, I took all those photos, and a common way for me to make a drawing now is to like take the photos, digital photos, bring them into Photoshop, mess around with them in Photoshop, try out all these different things, and, it's, and then at the end get a sort of a digital image which I will use a slide projector to transfer to the paper. I'll trace the outline and then I turn the lights on and just kind of draw from the image. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a backwards, if like if we think about hundreds of years ago where the architect or the sculptor would first start with the sketch and then end up with the building, mm -hmm. now I start sketching digitally or with the camera collect images, figure it out, and then the end part becomes the drawing. In a show like the current one, the title is Praise New York. It's, you know, the hands of faith leaders in New York City. I mean, there's a lot of 
different um, congregations here, and it's, it's a subject matter that has a lot of social intent, and you took the photographs yourself and, and spent time with those leaders, right? So mm -hmm. it's a different game than, than appropriating things. I mean, I always felt that I was doing it in a genuine way very mm -hmm. often. Like, I tried to be um, vulnerable and human and use humor to disarm people because it's not like Richard Prince who's like too cool for school. Mm -hmm. No, like I'm a human being that, want to, that wants to connect. There's like, a lot of room for ambiguity and appropriation, right? And it's, you can do both at once. You can be making fun of something and also sincerely love it. I mean, even Stephen Shore in his photographs, American Surfaces, which would seem to be making fun of like motels and you know, the Midwest and things like that, you know, even now them. if you speak to him, he loves it, he's adoring of it. Mm -hmm. But um, it seems that if you take your own photographs and you're dealing with something like, you know, faith leaders, that would require a kind of clearer position in relation to those people. I think that when you are involved in some sort of appropriative practice, you're always reflecting something of the culture. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that for a long time that was okay with me. It was like this thing that, that you learn, like the artist is involved in some sort of critique. Either mm -hmm. he critically reflects back, he or she critically reflects back something of the culture. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is you're always starting with what is the culture mm -hmm. and instead of imagining a possibility that is not yet there. And this idea of rendering which for me is usually often was just drawing, mm -hmm. could also mean to like bring something to fruition. Mm -hmm. So it could also be like rendering something of the future. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about these hand drawings, like I am reflecting back who these people are in New York now, but I also recognize that who New York is now is who America will become. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of rendering to bring into fruition mm -hmm. that I couldn't do, like I couldn't just appropriate these images because they haven't been made yet. The show hasn't been made yet because this America is in the process of becoming. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I sort of became more interested in recently. And you found these people while you spent time with them, right? Yeah, I went to meet everyone, usually in their house of worship. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes because of the pandemic, we would have to meet somewhere else. Chatted with them. Most of these people are relatively well known, so you can kind of do some research on them, find out what they do in their community. But we would talk about the history of their specific uh, building because I was interested in this that in New York City, there's so many churches, uh, shrines, temples, synagogues, mm -hmm. all over the place, and they I get repurposed and become another um, religious, mm -hmm. uh, you know, denomination. But they're everywhere, and we don't really notice it. Saying we, like a lot of people in the art world, are secular, so we're right. walking by churches all the time. It seems to me that uh, you, I, I don't know, are you spiritual or, or are you a student of religions? Have you had any sort of past interest in this kind of subject matter in particular? Or did it just strike you as being a subject that felt really essential now? You know, actually my first major in college was religious studies. Uh, interesting, yes. wow. But, but and that, that wasn't like I was in divinity school, that was like right. comparative religion. Sure. I think I've always been interested in why people believe what they believe, how they come to believe it. And actually, I ended up studying semiotics, but semiotics is not that different than religious studies, yeah. except it's sort of, it, it's how people come to believe maybe certain ideologies or have certain biases. Mm -hmm. But the way we come to understand something is both of those disciplines are interested yeah. in that. I'm Jewish, I do some uh, rituals that one might do like on a Friday night, mm -hmm. or, but I'm not uh, religious or orthodox. Cultural traditions that come with your, you know, your upbringing or your past. Yeah, I mean, I think- I don't think it's helpful though. Do you think it's helpful to split cultural from, from the... as if that the cultural ones don't have some sort of religious significance. It's true because, you know, I wouldn't describe myself as, as religious. I don't adhere to a particular religion, but I do feel a very strong co code of moral ethics that I think were taught kind of sideways to me growing up. So it's a philosophical question, but, you know, at this point too, maybe in a moment of kind of terrible crisis as we've been in the last two years, the search for people with answers is, mm -hmm. is maybe one path, yeah. one path, and people are finding all kinds of answers in different ways. But it seems to me like religious leaders might be a good place to start if, if they're good religious leaders. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, what yeah. I, yes, it, it, to, to search out the people with the answers 
And what I'm coming to understand is that no one has any of the answers. These, these folks don't have any more answers. Mm -hmm. And what we might, like, like often secular people might kind of it, think that the faith, that the belief in God is the most important thing w with religion. But I found that that is not the most important thing. And it's also like very Western, you know, Judeo-Christian or, or Islam Judeo-Christian because there are other religions. If you're a Buddhist, the absence of God is the faith or a Hindu, mm -hmm. there's many mm -hmm. gods. That's not the essence of any of these religious practices. Right. It varies, it's much more about ritual, about practice, about the community. Teachings, yeah. Yeah, and, and moral codes. Yeah. I mean, I, I found that what a lot of these places are is more like community centers. Mm -hmm. The priests, the rabbis, they're involved in a lot of things that are not like, yeah. you know, God related. Right, right, right. That seems like kind of a beautiful way to um, serve something, serve a higher power, I would think. Um, talk about the distortions of the hands. I mean, that's a very intentional and not very noticeable aspect of these, these drawings. Yeah. Um, I probably, now that I see them up, I maybe should have been a little more over the top with them. But because they start as photos, but then they go through a digital process, I recognize that to get good compositions and sort of like new compositions, because we start, when I meet everybody, I start with saying, okay, so what hand motions do you make maybe in, mm -hmm. in prayer or during a service, depending on what the belief system they come out of. It could be all these different things. But we also know that in art history, if we go over to the Met, we will see many hands throughout different cultures. If it's Hindu or Buddhist, they're the, the mudras or mm -hmm. uh, Byzantine mosaics, mm -hmm. always hands and religion. So we start with something that is recognizable and has a relationship to those. But I didn't want it to be literal. We don't want just that. Right. It has to have a relationship. So once I got it into the computer, I started playing around to try to have something that felt, have a relationship with that, but had something new. And very often that meant I moved the fingers around a little, I rebuilt each, each composition. Uh -huh. And I did that because it creates a feeling when you see it, unconsciously, it feels a little uncanny. It feels mm -hmm. a little weird. Sometimes you consciously know it, but very often you don't even consciously mm -hmm. know it. And it doesn't have to happen in all of the images. It only has to happen in a few. And once you catch one, mm -hmm. you look at all of them and say, mm -hmm. a little bit different. And that is because art, art can do those things. <laughs> and art can, I don't have to be literal. And as long as I'm respectful and everyone who, um, you know, who I pictured, I sent them some digital sketches and I said, are you okay with these? Because I don't want to represent them in any way. That... <laughs> right. But they're cool with it, you know? I mean, the uncanny and the magical are not that different. Right, right. So um, they, they, they are in a non-reality-based realm. Mm -hmm. and the scale's doing that too. I mean, they're monumental. I mean, yeah, they is... feel like physical presences in yeah. this space. And they're about the size of a human being. Yeah, in that sense, I could almost imagine relating it to the experience of a, of a temple Buddha or some like very large, imposing, almost a devotional aspect to the time it takes yeah. to render these drawings. That's a good question. Good observation. Because there is something, like when I draw it, is meditative. But there's also something that I recognize because labor and time can be like a service, it's like an offering or a devotion. Carl Handel's exhibition, Praise New York, is on view at Mitchell, Innes and Nash until April 16th. A public art project for the Los Angeles subway system will be unveiled in 2023. The following conversation with Mitch Epstein took place on Manhattan's West Side on March 10th, 2022. Mitch Epstein is a photographer based in New York, a pioneer of color photography during the 1970s. Epstein's work has become increasingly existential, addressing struggles over land rights, environmental activism, and the survival of ancient urban trees. You started uh, photography at a very young age, but was it always photography or did you have other interests that you might have gone into or tried first? Photography was when I got serious about pursuing a practice, mm -hmm. something. Although I didn't think about it in that way, it was just, it pulled me in. But it was fun, it was pleasurable too. I mm -hmm. think if it wasn't 
I wouldn't have so quickly been swallowed up. I moved to New York to study at Cooper when I was 20. It's kind of like anyone picking a major, I guess, in some ways, right? Yeah, I mean, I went, I was in art school. I studied other things. I did sculpture and drawing, but I didn't really have um, a, a special talent for mm -hmm. it. And photography in me just clicked. I had great teachers. And also, my connection to photography was simultaneous to moving to New York mm -hmm. and discovering the city, coming from a small New England town. It was also such an interesting time for photography in the early 70s. Well, there was a big tradition, like an institution of street photography at that time. Those guys had mostly Winogrand and some other people, you know, slightly older than you. They were doing street photography in black and white, but you pretty quickly adop adopted color as, an, as a new dimension to street photography. It really clicked when I started to shoot in color, uh -huh. partly because I was never great in the darkroom. <laughs> and the pictures were interesting so far as how the world looked rendered in color as Kodachrome slides, which is what I shot. So yes, it, there was that era of street photographers and Winogrand, I mean, it's a funny, I, I'm a little always uncomfortable. The, With that the, the terminology, street right, photography. Right. I mean, Winogrand always said, you know, don't, you know, don't pigeonhole me or don't, don't, don't define me and categorize me in that way. It was clear very early on that the world doesn't have to be arranged in some kind of hierarchical way in terms of value. Mm -hmm. Everything can look interesting, photographed. What was really interesting about New York in the early 70s was, yes, there was this practice going on um, amongst uh, a lot of you know photographers but also for me it was MoMA mm -hmm. and looking at pictures uh, that sort of early era of Sarkowski I mean it wasn't mm -hmm. the beginning for him John Sarkowski John Sarkowski was show, you know yeah. doing you know s multiple shows a year as a student at Cooper I was able to go up to the museum and look at pictures mm -hmm. handle them it was when Maria Morris uh, Hamburg was working with John Sarkowski on the Aceh archive. It was a thrilling time. You know, I was living this renaissance period, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you will, which was a, just a great, and, you know, and then I went on my way because the influence of Winogrand was obviously quite strong. I wonder if, if, there was, if there's been a sense at some point in the decades since uh, where, where it felt like photography, just showing something, some kind of hardship or some kind of condition that that wasn't good enough to to motivate and I'm, I'm thinking in terms too of the complexity of the kinds of issues that we now try to represent have you sensed that the the political issues you've wanted to represent over the years have needed some different approach through photography you know even in the 70s it wasn't that i was thinking in a always in a very conscious way about meaning having this long trajectory, making pictures really now for over 50 years, there was a very clear dividing line between the first 15, 20 years where I think I was working in a way very unselfconsciously. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a blessing mm. because <laughs> I wasn't really concerned about, you know, developing conceptual constructs that I had to work in. <laughs> I was just loving photography and mm -hmm. it was a way to be out in the mm -hmm. world. And I was aware, certainly, as mentioned, that the work, you know, had meaning and I was drawn to certain themes, but there wasn't a kind of critical agenda uh, mm -hmm. or a strong intentionality in that way. And then what happened? And Did then what happened? Well, it's interesting because I think a lot of what happened was a result of um, the end of my first marriage in the late 80s. Uh, I was married to Mira Nair, filmmaker. We worked collaboratively on several films. You spent time in India. I spent time in India, which was also a transformative opportunity for me to be thrust into a world that was not my own, and yet I still had a deep connection to it because I was part of an Indian family. But the end of the marriage in some way was unsettling. It was kind of a, you know, it was volcanic. Mm -hmm. It was just everything. Um, and I had to then, I think, confront in a more critical way um, 
what it was that I was up to. And I was older and I was sort of more mature, you know, in my late 30s and it was time. I also got past the fear that if I thought a lot about it, even, you know, in advance, that I wouldn't be losing the possibility of engaging with the mystery of the whole thing. Right. You know, that it wouldn't, it didn't have to be all premeditated. You know, the thing that's so kind of often um, startling to me is that I often don't know where I'm going next. I'm anti-formula, but I'm also, I think, anti-style. To me, that's what makes me interesting to myself as an artist, but I think it also makes me confusing to others because I don't, I don't subscribe to a certain um, identity or a certain you know, subject or way of working. I think you actually work more like a painter or a writer in some ways where they sort of are probing. They find their w way into place, a topic. They figure out what shape it wants to take. Because I think in photography, for example, there have been these formulas set by certain artists, the Bechers, most prominently perhaps of a very frontal mm -hmm. style of a certain subject and then even Dan Arbus you, there was great variety social variety in her photographs but it was always a square format subject in the middle that formula formulaic approach gets used over and over again in photography still but let's use maybe take a series that you've done for example um, property rights is a lot of different places and a lot of different subjects but how, for example, did you go to Standing Rock, or how did you become involved in pipeline resistance in Pennsylvania? You know, it's a lot about the yeah. personal experiences I have, and often with other people. Mm -hmm. So Standing Rock, I had followed what was going on in Standing Rock, but I had had a broken foot, and I wasn't really traveling in that year that it was really kind of building, but I, I was interested in it, and I went with uh, my wife Susan to the Women's March, the day mm -hmm. after the inauguration, uh, Trump's uh, mm -hmm. inauguration, and it just got under my skin. There was a kind of emotional swell that day that took me back to my pro protesting against the Vietnam War mm -hmm. in my teenage years. And when it was clear that Trump was going to be reversing the environmental review of the Dakota Access Pipeline, I thought, you know what, I've got to just go out there and experience it and put myself in this place that is going to be uncomfortable especially at that moment because law enforcement was bearing down on the resistance and that led you know uh, over the course of several years to look at conflicts uh, around land rights but my method of doing research and and developing a project like that is is quite idiosyncratic it's not academic but I also I think went to to regions where there were very heated confrontations going on, like the border, uh, to try to understand the border. But it was always about how to enter into those landscapes, and it was always through people. It's trusting that it's going to happen, mm -hmm. even though I don't have it all figured out at the beginning. But when you're an artist, it's the failure, it's the risks that, they, that do lead you to failure. Mm -hmm. You stumble, you fall, um, but they put you in a place that is uncomfortable and that ultimately can be very fruitful, very surprising in terms of where one mm -hmm. ends up. I think it really was ignited when I went to take pictures in Pittsburgh on, at Squirrel Hill after the uh, massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue. Mm -hmm. I started to think about what is our most sacred property and it's our bodies. Mm -hmm. And that got so uh, emphasized with the arrival of COVID. Um, and also, I think, even further escalated with the Black Lives Matter move movement. Mm -hmm. And Black Lives Matter happened, I felt like it was a kind of an apt, just a, a really important uh, manifestation of themes that, that did relate to some of these other conflicts and, and the resistance that was burgeoning um, in response to them. When you say you've sort of been anti style, but meanwhile, your photographs are just strikingly beautiful, most of them. Part of it is the scale they're printed at, but they're just very kind of delicate in terms of comp composition, I would say, if they mm -hmm. have something in common. But this leads me, though, to talk about like uh, beauty as a kind of moral direction. I mean, how does beauty play out in terms of a person unlocking a sense of uh, value or a sense of awakening their? sense of needing to care about things like the environment or other people. In a kind of critically conscious way, it was photographing in the aftermath of Katrina. 
it was on the Gulf Coast, driving along Gulfport, Biloxi, and you know, here's this place that's emblematic for its glorious mm. sunsets and so on. And to see, you know, the wrath of the hurricane, mm. uh, still, you know, very much intact, a month, six weeks, I guess, maybe afterward. Uh -huh. In a way, I, I think it was the beginning of an understanding where I could wrestle with this intersection of beauty and terror. And they both had their own truths. And somehow, the, the finding a tension between them. There's a whole tradition with, you know, in the last 15, 20 years with photography of, I call it disaster porn. Mm -hmm. It's like you can make a compelling picture of a disaster, right, but right. it, it's not enough. You have to work at it a, a, mm -hmm. a, a bit. Um, but the world is beautiful. Is there a sort of sort of beauty and terror in the in the New York Arbor series? Those beautiful monumental well, portraits of trees. First of all, they're in black and white, which is a little unusual for your career. It comes to do with the ways in which people choose to commune with trees. Uh -huh. So you know, maybe the most overt example is the weeping beech tree that I photographed in Brooklyn Botanic Garden, which mm -hmm. everybody and his mother and daughter and <laughs> grandmother, whatever, had to inscribe their name. And what was interesting was, uh, you know, so it's kind of like a little Wayne, you know, tattooed body, right? <laughs> you know, the, those graffiti inscriptions happened so many years ago, so they're kind of stretched. These trees That's are often odd. like two, 200 years old, right? I mean... Well, the oldest are three something, but yes. Wow. You know, there maybe the conceit was more sort of deliberate. I photographed in black and white because I wanted the trees to come forward as these singular elements, but within the context of the city. So the architecture and, and the flow of people would recede, and I just didn't want the distraction of contemporary color. It was very much a kind of a reaction or a response or a way of moving forward from American power which was, I think, in a personal, emotional way, a, a devastating project and also an opportunity for me with New York Arbor to return and to look at just the, the magic and the enduring aspects of a city like ours, which is, I think, still, I, I just feel like that's been one of the greatest gifts of my life, that I ended up here and, you know, in, and figured out how to endure its struggles and, 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 and difficulties. And I think that that's what it is with the trees, that they too have found a way to be enduring and invital. An exhibition of Mitch Epstein's photographs of India will be part of this summer's photography festival in Arles, France. This spring, the German publisher Steitel will release two new books of Epstein's work, Silver and Chrome and Recreation.